Hello again. Here we are. I'm, I'm preparing the video. Let's wait for, for a couple more seconds. All right, let's let's start. Um, welcome to this to the second round of our um, uh, regional stories. We are here in in a room with Mina Setra from uh, Amman. She is the deputy to secretary general, as well as Josh Situmorang um, from the Consortium for Agrarian Reform. Um, they will hold this presentation on in the Indigenous Youth Homecoming Movement, Securing Tenure, Nurturing the Earth. And we're going to start the session with a short introductory video. All right, the stage is yours, Mina. Okay, or Josh, I don't know. Uh, good evening, everyone. Evening, Prof. Uh, I, I would like to tell you stories about uh, Indigenous youth in Indonesia and initiative in the movement they call Homecoming, Indigenous Youth Homecoming Movement. Um, Actually, I, we're supposed to have a uh, Micheline Salata, uh, one of our colleagues. She is a new uh, appointed, uh, elected uh, chair of the Indigenous Youth Front. Uh, this is a wing organization of Aman, uh, that, which membership is all Indigenous youth in, in, uh, in the, from the communities. So yes, a few years ago, uh, this wing organization was established and since then, indigenous youth in Indonesia has been very actively uh, doing many different initiatives uh, in Indonesia. And I want to tell you the stories about uh, the homecoming movement that they started a few years ago. Uh, the homecoming movement is actually, it's a movement that it calls back the indigenous youth in the cities to return to the communities to help protect and manage their territories. Indigenous youth, one day they have a, a big gathering in, in Jakarta and they realize that there's so many problems happen in their, their territories. There's a encroachment of land that still happen, a land grab, grabbing conflict. And while, while that happened in the communities, many of them are in the cities, uh, stranded, jobless, looking for jobs. You know, so many of the youth then feels like there is an obligation for them to return back to protect their territories. At the same time, they can also help manage their territories. And since then, many indigenous youth returned to their territories and started various initiatives. Until today, 
We have 82 indigenous schools established. It's initiated and led by indigenous youth. Uh, we have organic farming based conservations. And I tell you that, you know, during pandemic, uh, indigenous peoples in Indonesia has become more uh, up, uh, this, 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 uh, the, the movement is very, become stronger and the productivity, food productivity is become stronger and, 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 and become more. Uh, we have 118 indigenous enterprises. Uh, it's like uh, agriculture based enterprises. Uh, 30 among them uh, are the collective farming of indigenous youth group. And the youth also created the community art centers where they can create songs, uh, music, dances, uh, learn about uh, traditional games, handicraft, and, and etc. And they also create another movement actually. It's called smartphone movement. So how to use uh, your cell phone to do so many things like writing your stories, uh, making videos, use social medias to promote the movement and, and to promote your work. Uh, so they, some indigenous youth leaders are quite smart in using the smartphone movement and train other youth uh, to, to do the same. And, uh, and other things that they do also, they involve in documenting data of indigenous peoples in Indonesia. In Amman, we have 875 data already collected, quite complete data, and 250s uh, were collected and documented by indigenous youth. Uh, I want to um, focus more on, on the indigenous youth homecoming movement. So it's the organic farming based conservations, the aim for food sovereignty. When I say organic farming, it's not 100% yet organic at the moment, but we are heading there. And the youth want to be the pioneer to change the cultures. You know, now we have, it's not easy to change the cultures that already rooted for a long time where people use herbicides, you know, you know, poisons uh, to the land, no? Uh, but now the youth said that they want to, to be the one, the pioneer in, in in bring back this organic farming. So they, they, they start this uh, organic farming based conservations, they call it. Uh, it is basically a movement to manage indigenous territories through collective farming and gardening based on traditional knowledge and combined technology. Uh, it is very important, uh, we think, because it, it is actually a counter narrative. You know, there's assumption, uh, an assumption that jobs only exist in the cities. Uh, you know, many, many, uh, many indigenous youth went to the cities to study. And then when they return home, the parents usually said, why, so how, why I use all my money to, for you to study? And then at the end, you return back to your communities. Because there's a, an assumption that job is when you are in the cities working in front of your laptop or in the office, you know, something like that. So the youth think that they have to change this, uh, this, this narrative and, and bring this uh, farming and uh, job into this, the, in the communities that while in the community, they can create their own job. And they proven this by farming and gardening businesses built by young people have been able to generate economic income with more sufficient val uh, value actually than if they work in the cities. Uh, it has been proven in many indigenous group, indigenous youth group already experienced this. And at the same time also, uh, this movement can concentrate in production centers in the communities. And also at the same time, it can reducing the burden on the city's populations. You know, because uh, you know, in, in the long run, when more people return back to the communities and manage their land, their own land, it can help uh, reducing the burden uh, on the cities. And uh, of course, it is important at the same time, it's preserving and, and lightening the, the trend of various uh, in local food types. So that's actually what the indigenous youth do and uh, in, in Indonesia. And we want to spread this, uh, all that, that the indigenous youth uh, do and we promote this globally, we want to influence others also to join us in return back to our territory and nurturing our, our earth uh, 
uh, by doing this uh, this work. And these are examples of the indigenous schools that established and managed by indigenous youth. Uh, in 2018, 18, we uh, have an award from the Ministry of Culture and Education for the indigenous uh, uh, schools initiatives. And this is examples of the, uh, the farming uh, that indigenous youth started and managed until today. Uh, there's from South Sulawesi, North Sulawesi. I just want to show you these photos so can, you can have sense of what I'm talking about. And this is actually a herbal medicines garden. Uh, the youth there in Goa combine it with also tourism so people can come and learn about medicine plants. And uh, actually they also establish some buildings like this so people can do meetings. Even the Ministry of Culture and Education came here and have some several workshops together with the indigenous peoples there. Uh, this is in Toraja. So I have like endless of photos just to show you because of, we are so excited about what the youth do. And this is onion. They already have several harvests and it's so, uh, it's, it's good harvest for the youth. And this is cucumber. And this one specifically, uh, this is in Sakai communities in Riau. Sakai communities is uh, in Aman, we categorize them as a, almost extinct because they don't have land left. All their land already taken over by oil pump plantations and mining. But when we start this program, they feel like they have to make their land pro productive again. So they think about what plant they can plant there. So they plant watermelon. <laughs> And they have so many like tons of watermelons. And the most important things uh, was the one who bought all their watermelon was the military who have conflict with them for so long. And military came and said, we want to buy your watermelon. And they start a communication, conversation with them, you know. So it's also create like a space where they can start conversation. That's a very interesting from this one. And this is in West Kalimantan. And this is examples of the smartphone movement of how they use, use smartphone to promote their work. Yeah, that's from me and Joshua uh, to you. Thank you, Kamina. Um, I think I will explain a little bit more about the, the agrarian reform movement, especially initiated by young uh, generation or young people uh, of consortium for agrarian reform. As you can see that there are several um, common agrarian crises in Indonesia. Uh, one of the six agrarian crises is about the generation crisis of young peasants, of young or young small scale farmers. And we are as the movement organizations, as the consortium of many peasants, uh, unions and fisher folks and indigenous peoples as well. Uh, we have offered uh, some solutions like the Academy of Genuine Agrarian Reform, in which um, it is the, the academy that was established and um, built by my organizations to educate the young um, um, peasants in the villages and to, to give them some ideology um, struggles about the agrarian reform and then the Damara for economy access but it is actually not only for the economy access but also for um, um, the, the transformative uh, change that in which the, the young um, people also take part in it and then we also have paralegal training for young people Agrarian Legal Aid Service, in which we educate uh, the young people about the regulation and the law and how to advocate their uh, organizations, because many of our member organizations are still uh, facing conflict. And then mass mobilization is also important for us to, to um, voice out um to the government to encourage them to to conduct the fair and just agrarian reform uh, policy next i think um like me now i also have um, endless photos but i want to make it short that you can see um, many of our uh, young people also have like initiative in 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 the economy in their economy in the villages 
and you can see also in the uh, screen that it's also um, some students um, from the school was built by the peasant union by themselves and the schools uh, have been recognized by the government and that's one of the successful story of our movement and this um, picture show us about how the role of young people demand to the government um, and voice out their uh, struggles. I think that's from me. Thank you. Thank you, Mina and Joshua. We are so punctual. You can see that I'm I'm being a timer right now, and we have thirty seconds left. What? A amazing. Um, so let let's open open the plenary for questions. Just raise your hand, unmute yourself. <clears throat> Don't be shy. And if anyone still have the young things in their, their self, <laughs> join the youth movement. <laughs> I, I can I can start breaking the ice. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mina and Joshua. A very interesting presentation. I'm so amazing to see what the youth movement uh, is able to do. and. Uh, um, I was wondering, I mean, it, like if I am, I'm a student or I'm a young person that want to initiate something in the community, how can I do that? Like, uh, how can I source the initial financial support to start an activity or looking for like the technical support? Uh, how does it work? And, uh, and then how long usually it takes before these initiatives become sustainable by themselves? In, in your experience. Thanks. Should I answer now or two questions? Uh, as you wish, but I think you can may maybe just answer the question. Okay. Well, uh, in, in our experience, uh, usually the young people, they first they find other young people who have the same minded and create a group yeah, to, to, to start this. And uh, when they return to the community, there's actually not really much. You don't really have. Uh, you don't really need much money to do it. The the, the most important things is they go to the elders and ask permissions from the elders to use the like piece of land in the community so uh, where they can work, they can start their work. Uh, in the other room, uh, somebody also asked about how they the, they use the land. And usually the, they have meetings with the elders, ask permissions, and the elders, use, mostly the elders happily uh, give the chance for the youth to use the land so they can start their, their initiative. There are few experiences where the elders about a little bit cynicism about their ideas. They think like, ah, you're not serious, <laughs> especially you come from the cities. Uh, but the youth, they, they, they proven that they can do it. They provide evidence. They work seriously in the land and it can produce and it's become examples. You know, one story in Hong Kong communities, the first photos that I saw you, uh, many youth uh, in the cities return back and some of them actually also work in another community somewhere uh, in gold mining. So they return and they start this, uh, uh, this farming and it can really like uh, create the job for them. And more and more indigenous youth who do the gold mining, they return back. And then it's become more huge. And now every woman in the communities, they also start their own vegetable farming. <laughs> so the youth thinking like, oh no, no, no one buy our food and our vegetables anymore. But now they, they, they sell it to the market. I think the most important things is, uh, they, they, they started and actually they learn from their own elders or their parents on how to do the farming because all their knowledge, the knowledge is actually there. They just need to find uh, time and to learn about it and doing it by practice. Yeah. Thank you both for the, the question and the answer. Let's go on with um, Graham. 
Hello, I am fascinated by your, your story and um, especially because young people are the ones who are going to sustain any, any tenure, any security of that into the future. Um, and most of my questions are actually answered in your, in your, um, in your explanation just now, but I, I guess for me, it, it's how strong is, are they the ties to the land and culture that these young people who are now engaging in community work and, and, and you know, tilling the land and so on, how, what program is there by perhaps the community or the elders to ensure that the, the cultural attachment remains strong? Thank you. Thank you for that questions. I think that's an important questions. You know, we realize that many indigenous youth has been separated, disconnected with their land and with their culture. But by having this uh, homecoming movement, uh, they can reconnect with their land and slowly they reconnect again with all their cultures because they, you know, by doing this farming, they day by day, they start conversation, engagement with the elders because the elders also goes there and talk to them, you know. Uh, and, and this reconnection is really important because it's make the youth feel like they are a, a part of their communities after they've been separated for so long uh, in their school, in the cities. And so this is, I think, uh, very important uh, in, uh, for the indigenous youth. Thank you. Um, let's get another question from Kundan. Thank you for that absolutely lovely presentation. I'm so, so excited to see this. And so one of the questions that uh, observation and comment and question that I wanted to make was, you know, like the indigenous youth who have come to home, actually the larger humanity itself needs to come to home to indigenous people to learn from them. If we have to avoid kind of crisis that we are facing and uh, how do we kind of scale up these efforts that not only indigenous youth but you know the the leaders the political leaders the corporate leaders others can come and learn from indigenous people on how to take care of uh, our land and our earth and our relationship and uh, and and how, how do we kind of really this for means i i i don't see means uh, uh, what other records we have uh, in terms of, you know, in our future of uh, face the climate change and conservation to, and the crisis of biodiversity. And so that's something which uh, I, if this is so fascinating that you have been able to scale it up um, on, at a larger scale. And can we scale it up further to include even non-Indigenous youth, the future leaders of the world, uh, to kind of learn from what is going on? Also, how do we kind of uh, uh, bring this experience and learning what you have done, for example, this would be so important for places like India or Nepal, where the indigenous youth is feeling lost and feeling out of place in the current culture and politics. And how do they connect back to their values and their culture values and politics? So that's kind of both a comment and a question that, you know, how do we? Thanks, you know. Thank you, Kundan. Good to see you. Uh... Well, actually, in Indonesia, it's not only indigenous youth. No, as you see, Joshua also uh, in her in his presentations, the peasant movement, the youth from the peasant movement, also doing a great great work on on return home, back to their communities and manage their land. And um, you know, we've been, we've been promoting this work uh, globally. So every time I we have a, a conferences uh, in the climate change COP, for example. We talk about this and promote through film as well, and in conferences and in meetings among indigenous uh, ourselves. Uh, actually, the Latin America is uh, behind us, no, not behind us. Uh, they also started They also st started this movement as well with their youth in there. I, I, I met them uh, last time in Glasgow, and there's already many stories about Indigenous youth return home and make their own documentations, uh, co co uh, collecting data, and started their own like uh, uh, handicraft uh, 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 product productivities and the indigenous schools also. So it's it's really great that that this start 
move globally, not only in Indonesia, but also different places. I really hope that in Asia also, uh, we can do this, do this more uh, massively. Yeah? But also, not only in indigenous communities or the peasants uh, movement, I think this can also be done in, in, from uh, on the in city level. I, once I was asked, what about us who live in the cities? We don't have communities to return back. Well, you can start your own gardening. You can form your own group, maybe with the different kind of gardening, but you can always start different initiatives uh, and you can provide your own food at least. Uh, not buying from the market, but you know, make your own garden. Um, there's many different kind of initiatives that the youth can do. If in global level, Greta, we have Greta Thunberg talking on the street and big demonstrations. We have in our communities, indigenous youth doing a real uh, work uh, in the community level. No? So that's uh, what inspired us as well. So we, we can be part of the movement in our own way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for this very, very interesting and great session. Um, thank you, Mina and Josh, for taking the time to present your amazing activities. And we're perfectly timed because we have just been called back to the plenary. See you there in a second. <laughs>